Welcome to another show where we'll be enriched by discussion and engagement on issues that affect Africa. Now this week we're looking into poaching on the African continent and we're asking the question, how can we best protect our wildlife? We have an amazing panel of experts and they share their views. You get to have your say too. And of course, we have Africa's top 10. And this week we look at top 10 national parks across the African continent. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuro. On the show this week, we look at the scourge that is draining the wealth of wildlife across the African continent. We have a panel of experts who look at poaching. How can we address the situation? How do we protect our wildlife? Let's go straight to the discussion. On our panel this week, we host Lisa Karanja, governance and anti-corruption expert and board member of the Business Advocacy Fund. Mugo Kibati, Director General of the Vision Delivery Secretariat spearheading Kenya's Vision 2030. Boniface Mwangi, photographer, visual artist and activist. Dan Arieli, renowned professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University. Dr. Martin Kimani, regional security expert and Kenya's permanent representative to UN Habitat. Alex Awiti, Director at the East African Institute based at Aga Khan University in Nairobi. Dr. Paula Kahumbu, Executive Director at Wildlife Direct and founder of the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign. Vision 2030, Mugo, you have this vision for a greater Kenya. We are affected by a very real human wildlife conflict. The numbers when it comes to poaching, it seems, have been increasing. And uh, Paula can confirm the situation for us in a short while, but how do we start to address this issue so that you get buy-in when it comes to fighting poaching? Uh, I think the common perspective within Vision 2030 and the fact that um, in our economic pillar, we're trying to grow the economy and grow jobs and tourism is a critical uh, part of our, uh, our national development goals, the wildlife is what you know, many people around the world know Kenya for. But beyond uh, the economic value of our wildlife, it's our heritage. And it's part of, you know, uh, I, I, I like to think about uh, Kenyan wildlife, our elephants, the big five, as part of what makes Kenya, Kenya. And if the big five didn't exist, if our elephants didn't exist, or if they were decimated for any reason, uh, over and above the notion of the economic, the heavy economic loss we'd have as a country, I would feel that our heritage as Kenyans would be lost. Kenya would cease to be what I have grown up and dream of Kenya as. So I think it's important that we get all of us as Kenyans, we convey this to all Kenyans and get to have a campaign, in my view, that begins to make Kenyans realize that this is part of our heritage, it's part of what makes us Kenya. Thank you for that, Paula, coming straight to you. And, and you've been focusing on this issue for years now, uh, getting in trouble even with some of the powers that be. When you speak out about poaching, there was a time you were banned from entering the national park. I remember that you were saying our animals are being killed and the Kenya Wildlife Service was denying that it was happening. Um, tell us, how bad is the situation and how do we address human wildlife conflict? As Mugo says, every citizen needs to really understand the facts. And, the, and our campaign really is to inform the public so that the public can then decide, is this wildlife important enough to us in terms of our heritage for us to protect it? I mean, how do we demonstrate that we are going to take a stand, that this is too important a loss, that we were going to defend the way we would defend our children? I mean, once these guys have taken our elephants and our rhinos and our lions, these are criminals. They're going to take everything else because they're after money. So, um, how serious is it? Well, I was banned from Nairobi National Park because I asked the public to be vigilant and to monitor what was happening with the rhinos. 
If we don't stand up as citizens, as government, as corporates and say, this is, this is basically destroying fundamentally uh, Kenya's natural assets, then what are we saying? We're just giving it away? Are we just going to roll over and let people take what matters to us and what is valuable to us? Alex, I'll come straight to you from those comments. And, you know, it's our heritage, it's our wealth. The Society for International Development, which um, does research across East Africa, has really, you know, emphasized the importance of our, our wildlife and our resources. But we need to get the buy-in, as I mentioned earlier, of the people. Paul is saying, what do we value? Where's the, di the disconnect? And, and I think, in many cases, the conception of conservation needs revisiting. We are faced with a situation where we have islands of conservation, enclaves that are disconnected, that are not even self-sustaining in a sea of humanity. What does this mean? Can we rethink the paradigm around the construction of the colonial relic that conservation is in the context of a very dynamic society? This conversation has not happened. And I think until that happens, until people who were paid to think and people who were paid to be minders of natural resources begin to think about this changing context and begin to think more clearly in a more nuanced way, is it people, what about people and conservation? There's a tension there. How do you resolve this? And how do you begin to uh, get people like us and Paolo to rethink about conservation as interconnected enclaves of natural heritage but interfacing with rapid modernization of all cultural systems. Wow, that's powerful, redefining conservation. Um, and on that, let me start now with you. Let's start this journey into redefining uh, conservation. How would you begin this? Looking at the large youth population that we have, a lot of people feeling disenfranchised outside the system. How do you start to tell them that our wildlife matters? This is an issue for you. How do we communicate the message and what do we do? You have to ask yourself that how many Kenyans have seen an elephant? Uh, because most of us see elephants as like a tourist attraction. Uh, there's no ownership. They don't belong to us. The money doesn't trickle down, trickle down to the economy. So if you do not show them the value in the elephants, they're not going to protect them. So if you go to those communities, they know who the poachers are. Maybe they come from the local village. But because they know the money that goes to tourism doesn't come back to them, they'll never raise an issue. So we need to actually see how do we ensure that the money that is actually going to tourism or the money that is coming in the country through tourism is actually trickling down. That's number one. Number two, when you arrest poachers, we go for the small guy who's killing the elephant, but we never arrest the funder. So we know very well that this is a country of the big men walk away, the small guy gets, gets the blame. So if it's possible for us, if the government is going to crack down on poaching, you need to say who is exporting our ivory to China who is paying for those containers because you arrest a poacher, but the poacher has a, has a master. Who is the master behind that? But let's, the most critical thing is that Kenyans should actually own the elephants and say they belong to us. We need to see elephants, we need to visit our parks, but our parks are accessible to the common man. And if you go to areas like Masai Mara, which is actually, they have said it's the eighth one of the, eighth one of the world, if you're going to the park, the level of poverty among the Masai community is shocking. So as long as they are poor, they don't care about the elephants, and you can make all the noise that you want on this kind of level, but for them it doesn't matter to them at all. Absolutely. So Lisa, with those socioeconomic issues and, and, and the legal issues right now, there's a bill in Parliament. What would you say needs to be done decisively to address all these issues? When you're looking at issues of corruption and you're looking at issues of behaviour change, um, there are very common themes, as Boniface pointed out. Um, one of these issues is about looking at who are the players in the market. Um, Martin and I were talking about what happens. Do, do, do society, do, does a country get rich first and then deal with corruption? Or do they deal with corruption and then get rich? And we were thinking about the British Raj and how uh, people would go over to India with the understanding that they would benefit personally. Um, from their positions. So you've got to spread the message, you've got to increase the number of voices. You've also got to look at law, obviously. Um, you know, uh, very often in Kenya we like talking about laws and saying, well, it's not going to work, but you have to have a framework. I mean, you cannot develop 
um, a system of punishment or anything like that without that framework. Um, and then it obviously comes back to the incentives and accountability. And as Dan said, it's not necessarily cost-benefit analysis. Paul and I were wondering, why do poachers choose to poach rather than carjack? Is it easier? Is the punishment less? Um, is it about accessibility to you know, location? So you've got to really start understanding people's incentives to do things. And you've got to understand the complexity of incentives. And then I think one of the things we also miss doing here is that we don't facilitate uncorrupt behavior. So it's not just about punishing corrupt behavior, but how do you facilitate uncorrupt behavior? Coming back to the very real on the ground issues, Martin, what would you suggest with your experience in conflict is an effective way to start to address issues at a national level or even cross-border, ensuring that the interests of the communities are addressed and protected. Kenyans and Africans have highly sophisticated and developed moral language that is created by an infrastructure of institutions, churches, family groups, uh, funeral committees, wedding committees. The idea of expanding your compassion to include people around you is so present. Uh, and I feel as if that has been the case for many years with our wildlife, with nature, a sense of responsibility. So something has happened, and maybe it's a rapid change in our societies that has disconnected us somehow from this private feeling of reaching out and the elephant. And um, So rather than think of it in terms of you know, the conflicts, because yes, in a war zone, elephants get killed a lot more than, let's say, in Kenya, where there's no war. So my sense, Julie, is the challenge really is how to use all these institutions that, that cre cre have moral claims and create moral obligations to include uh, our wildlife and to include nature. And, and I don't think this itself is a very difficult thing, but it's conceptually difficult to think about it and how to actually get it done. And it makes me feel like it needs uh, moral leaders, ethical leaders, to begin to talk about this, for young people to begin to, to talk about this, because I think they have a much easier way of thinking through these issues and pulling their parents and the people around them into this world about well, how can these elephants die. Dan, I come to you now. Um, you had said to Paula earlier, you know, this bill you're passing and perhaps just, you know, making the sentences longer, you know, imposing uh, bigger fines may not work, or you said it won't work. What do you think would be the most effective way to start to address this as a, na a nation, but also even across borders for Africa? What advice do you have? So th this is very much a, a tragedy of the commons situation. Um, there's a natural national resource that everybody is part of and everybody gets to benefit. But for each individual, it's worthwhile to defect, to take advantage of this. And VAT is the same thing, right? For each of us, it would be good for the country if the tax base was bigger. But for each of us, it's selfishly more beneficial if we don't pay taxes. Um, <clears throat> Wildlife is the same thing, right? For each of us, if we were poachers, it would pay off right now to be poacher, actually pays off dramatically, uh, but it, it's bad for everybody and in the, in the long run. And people generally don't deal well in these, in these situations. And, and I think we should separate the criminals into two types. Uh, there's organized crime. And organized crime, these are the people who do things in a very computational way. And um, if you make the prison sentence longer, odds are ivory will just become more expensive. You know, and then, and then temptation will just increase. I think the issue is how do you make it immoral? And, and when we think about immorality, we think about something we call taboo trade-offs. Uh, when you ask people, you know, would you sell me your kid? Right? Unless they're a teenager, people said, say, say no, it, it's just unthinkable. Uh, you know, this is just not something that we do. Um, and, and those taboo trade-offs, that's when morality comes into the, into the issue. It's, nothing that, it's not a question of money, we just don't do it. 
And the question is, how does a country start thinking about natural resource and its future and what unifies it in, in moral um, aspect? Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. In my experience in the media, I've found that you give out positivity, you get positivity right back. You give out negativity, you breed negativity. You inform and enlighten the public and they do react to that information. Knowing that, Boniface, and, and with the work that you're doing in activism, what do you think you and the media and other stakeholders of, of that kind should be doing to start to change the narrative and, and, and make people understand that we can all be part of protecting what is our heritage? I think we need to first celebrate people doing the good, the good work uh, because you never do that so that you can actually have alternative heroes and leaders that you can look up to. Uh, we are bringing up kids in a society where there's no one to look up to in terms of, apart from musicians, but talking about leaders in the corporate world who are doing the right thing, leaders in government who are doing the right things. And once we do that, then we can actually say we have role models to look up to. But the other thing is that we don't reward good deeds. We don't do that. And you have come to learn as a young man, uh, living with working with young people and actually living around where young people are, we have realized that if you do it the good way, you'll never make it. So unless you show them the right way, and we need the government in this very, very much, if we, it has to be two way, it can be done one way, because as much as you celebrate the good people, the bad will always triumph, the bad will always make it to the news, the bad will always get elected, the bad will always actually call the shots. Um, Mugo, let me come to you. Um, the very real issue, and also something I learned through conflict reporting, was the fact that nothing is black and white. Why are ethics and morals seen as objective black and white? Shouldn't they also be subjective? The truth is that people have different truths, and each of those different truths has value and, and, uh, and is real. How do we then, and you are here as government, and, and so I challenge you with this, what role does the government have to play in sitting down, looking at the very real truths that Kenyan communities are dealing with, and proactively ensuring that there is a way to address, especially, in particular, the human-wildlife conflict? Things are not black and white. And I was speaking to Boniface earlier about his activism and saying that we all have a role to play. You know, Paula and I normally have debates about her uh, decibels in terms of pushing in Kenya, uh, but it works and some of us come and have a different role um, to play. In Vision 2030, we're dealing with the hardware. All the ports and airports and roads and rail, even judicial transformation, education reform, healthcare reform, all, this, all that is hardware. The ethics and the values, that's the software that we must address. And we have to be honest about it. To your question, what should government um, specifically do? I think government has a role to really try and, for, and, and, and head towards zero tolerance. Because the tragedy of the commons you're talking about, you know, if there's a law in place and you actually go afoul, whether you are Boniface or Mugo, the penalty must be enforced. You know, the, 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 the new fines must be enforced. The traffic penalties must be enforced without favoritism. But again, as a society, religion, I think that we all want to do the good things, but how do we en uh, enlarge our moral universe such that what I see as a private wrong is also wrong in the public domain? Lisa, let me come to you. Give me three critical things that you would like to see done, whether by gov government, private sector, religious organizations, in our environments to start to address mindset change around the po poaching issue. We, we talked about the law and obviously uh, legislation is necessary, not sufficient, we've agreed, but it is necessary. We've, we've got to have legislation and legislation unfortunately is, has to be objective. You cannot create an, a subjective law. You cannot say, this will apply to Paula, but not Martin, but then to Boniface, but not whatever. So we've got to have that basic framework set up. Um, and we've got to have the penalties because, um, as I said, it's incentives and accountability. And the accountability comes in punishment um, and it comes in, in creating an atmosphere of fear around doing certain actions. Um, and so that's very necessary. That would be one. Um, the second thing in terms of the the understanding, the awareness campaign, and, and I think this is one thing that's happening, 
Um, but it's very important to understand why people aren't aware, I think. Because somebody was saying, um, okay, it's, it's our national asset. We've got to all understand that it benefits us. Some people might tell you, does it? Is it all stolen? So if it's all stolen, then why should I care about the elephants? Because even if it does bring an income, does it come to me? So we've got to understand whether people actually believe that it is an asset. We've got to show a way, very fundamentally, how it benefits them. You talked about messages and things being lost. Um, that was a huge thing in Transparency International. You know, you can't keep talking about corruption, corruption, corruption. And the phrase I hate is zero tolerance to corruption. Every office, every government office had those tired old posters. This is a zero tolerance to corruption zone or whatever. And it's horrendous. After a while, people don't listen. And they also don't understand things that are not part of their lives. You can't keep talking about $80 billion. Even to me, that means nothing. So it becomes zero in my head. And I don't listen to it. And we actually realized we had to start giving messages that um, meant something to people. We would say, this is two hospitals in Muranga that have gone. And then guys would be like, hey, wait a minute, this is terrible. So we've got to start seeing campaigns, but we've got to see campaigns that are very realistic um, and that engage actual people's lives and, and why, why they should engage with the thing about kids. I mean, you know, get the kids and get the mothers and then you've got a serious, uh, you've got a serious push. We are eventually beginning to own our government more and more. That is what the Kenyan constitution represents. It's an expansion of our ownership of our government, which we haven't owned for a long time. It's existed for 50 years as one of ours, but it's mostly been an instrument that was passed down that was never meant to be ours. So Kenyans have, I think, begun this process of joining these two issues, the hidden order of moral expectation and engagement with government. But it's right at the beginning now. And I think with time, it's going to expand. So in terms of religion, to me what matters about it is really the moral communities and the ethical communities that are based on religious language and precepts. Um, and so the mosque and the church is full of hypocrites, of course, but its language and its community does create a form of responsibility that will eventually, I think, embrace government. There is a heavy burden of peer pressure uh, in, in a lot of ways. And I think in many, in, in many cases, I think we triangulate um, our morality around everybody who's around us. And, and I think in many cases, it's then how do I, do I fit in? And that, that, that social constraining pressure becomes too much to a point where it just breaks down and you say, well, if you can't beat them, maybe you want to join them. Uh, so, so the thing is, how do you create these moral icons and how do we stage them to a point where they have this dominant influence to then get people to go on a different trajectory? I think it's not possible, but we should aim for it. And here's the thing. We do very well in environments when we have strict rules. You know, if you had a rule that says half a glass a day is okay, how big would that glass be, <laughs> right? Or you would say, I'm drinking now for the last two days and for the one day next week. There'll be all kinds of playing with the rules. The moment you have very strict rules, this really helps. That's why religion is so successful. So I think having very clear rules about what is acceptable and not acceptable is the right thing to aim for because it creates clarity. And this clarity is the thing that would actually get people to act well. And I'm going to give Paula the final word. And what I want you to do, Paula, is literally look into the camera over there and give a message. You're speaking to this audience, yes, but you're also speaking to a much wider audience. What do you want to see happening? What do you want to see Africans doing to protect their heritage, their wildlife, and their resources? As a conservationist, I, I realize that everything I've studied for and worked for is worthless unless the message is adopted by people in general, from politicians down to children. And it's very clear to me that many people, wherever they are, feel that conservation and wildlife is something for the elite, for the tourists, and has no value to them. We need to be very clear in translating into language how important this wildlife is as a heritage and as a, an asset for Africa 
in general, what I would like to see is a complete, um, what would I say, rethinking of what our natural assets mean and how we as individuals, no matter which sector of society we come from, what background, what social class, what tribe, what nationality, I would like to see every single individual recognize the importance of preserving this heritage into perpetuity, not just for us individuals in Kenya or in Africa, but as global heritage. Thank you very much for that, Paula. And, you know, I'm just going to end this session by saying it's very possible for everybody to play a role. And an example of that is a young man called Richard Turere, who actually is a mentee of Paula's. And it, how many of you have heard of Richard? Most of you. So a young Maasai boy living in an environment where they're being attacked, their animals are being eaten, they're under threat from the lions, realizes that lions are also under threat from the humans and that he can find a solution and, and builds a simple light that goes on automatically when there's movement and, and is actually solving a problem, protecting the wildlife and also solving a problem for the people themselves. Now, if a child could be that inventive and that wise, each of us could surely play a bigger role than we're doing today. So I think he's an inspiration. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Well, the question we must ask ourselves is, do our animals and our wildlife hold value for us? Do they have a place in the future of our children? Will they hold great value for generations to come? And if any of the answers are affirmative, then we must ask ourselves, what role do I play in protecting this heritage for my future and the future of this continent? While we continue this conversation, getting your views on this issue, let's take a look at what you have to say. This week, we asked you, in your own view, what should be done to protect our wildlife from poachers and conserve our environment? Stephen McLeish Dawn says, we need to promote domestic tourism. We can't protect something we don't appreciate. Communities have to be empowered with information about why it is important to conserve the environment. Why should someone have a beautiful environment when they can't feed their children or give them a decent education? Yet, when we destroy the environment, we can't achieve the basics. I think we need to strike a balance and we shall move forward. Stephen Mushiri says, the government should make people see the long-term benefits of conserving nature as opposed to immediate cash obtained. Many people still don't see the rationale of conserving the environment. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. Thank you so much for keeping your thoughts coming in, sharing your views and having an engaging, dynamic discussion on poaching in Africa and how to protect our wildlife. Right now, let's take a look at Africa's top 10 and we focus on the top 10 national parks across the continent. On Africa's top 10 this week, we focus on Africa's best national parks. This is according to a 2013 CNN travel review. Starting us off at number 10 is Perinet Reserve in Madagascar. An astounding 80% of Madagascar's wildlife can be found only on the mysterious island of the moon. Perinet is a location of the country's greatest tracts of Indian Ocean rainforest and the only place to see the giant Indri, the largest living lemars. At number 9 is Okavango Delta in Botswana. It is the world's biggest inland delta, a wetland wilderness that is almost the size of Israel. A waterborne safari paddling over the clear waters in a Mokoro dugout can either be unforgettably serene experience or one of Africa's most nerve-wracking wildlife encounters. This depends on the proximity of Delta's great poles of hippos and its six-meter crocodiles. Slotted at number eight is Kruger National Park in South Africa. 
It is famous for the great diversity of habitats. 16 macro ecozones have been recognized here. They can be found in the 300 kilometers of wilderness that lie between the Limpopo and the Crocodile Rivers. Apart from the wonderful wildlife sightings, other great adventure draw cards of Kruger are its range of multi-day hiking trails and mountain biking tours. At number 7 is Hagar National Park. Located in Algeria, this immense park is 40 times the size of the entire Gambian nation. But, far from being a massive wasteland, the center of the world's greatest desert is a diverse area, posting classic dunes and a 3,000-meter mountain range. At number 6 is the Gambia, located in Gambia. It is effectively a little more than the opposing banks of West Africa's greatest river. But the six national parks strung along Gambia River constitute one of Africa's most unexpected safari venues. Not only is it a paradise of bird watchers with almost 600 species, but also its bush is home to monkey, baboon and chimpanzee and its crocodile infested waters offer rare sightings like African otter and manatee. At number 5 is Itosha National Park, Namibia's premier wildlife venue and one of Africa's most hypotonic landscapes. The park takes its name from a local word meaning Great White Place. The startling white pan covers about a quarter of Itosha's 22,300 square kilometers. The key to wildlife spotting here is to focus on the waterholes that dot this lizard baking mirage haunted plains. Itosha is home to the Big Five vast herds of gazelle and antelope and more than 300 species of birds. Tanzania's Ngorongoro crater comes in at number 4. Many describe it as the most compact wildlife venue on the planet. From the first spellbinding glimpse of the crater and the stomach churning descent down the inner walls, your senses are assaulted by Africa at its most intense. During a single morning, you can easily rack up unforgettable sightings of elephant, rhino, buffalo, lion and leopard. Coming in at number 3 is Kidepo Valley National Park. Here in borders with Sudan and Kenya's northern frontier district, it is Uganda's most beautiful remote and least explored park. With sprawling savanna and soaring mountains, Kidepo National Park might be the most picturesque park in Africa. It is best for spectacular landscapes and great buffalo heads. At number 2 is Botswana Central Kalahari Game Reserve, described as Africa at its lowest. The Sun Bushmen have lived here for an estimated 30,000 years and the first explorers knew this area as the plains where courage fails. It is a good place for lion sporters, best for untamed, limitless desert wilderness and the tough Kalahari lions. And at number one is the Maasai Mara National Reserve, Kenya. The Maasai Mara National Reserve is also known as the Mara. It is the venue for arguably the most astounding wildlife spectacle on earth. Every year during the Great Migration, an estimated 2.5 million animals make a round trip journey of 2,000 kilometers across the Serengeti ecosystem between Tanzania and Kenya. The Mara has been described as the most prolific wildlife real estate on earth and is Africa's greatest safari destination. And that is Africa's top 10 this week. You may be asking yourself, what impact can I have as an individual on huge issues like poaching and many others that affect the African continent? Well, we have a quote for you that will address that very question. It's a humorous and a very wise quote from the Dalai Lama. And he said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Need I say more? Blessings to you and blessings to Africa. See you again next week.